Hi guys, this is Dr. Jennifer Clemick Yingling. Today we're going to talk about Renee and Weber tests, and the name of the lecture is Can You Hear Me Now? Please like and share our resources. We can be found on Facebook, there's an APRN Central Study Group, Instagram, Twitter, and we also have a website at www.aprncentral.com. APRN Central is committed to supporting new novice nurse practitioners, as well as nurse practitioners who have been doing it a while in their lifelong learning. So Verizon had that catchy little phrase, can you hear me now? And we all made a joke about it. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? But the thing that's really not funny is that there's more than 48 million Americans who have hearing loss. So it's going to be something that you commonly see in your practice. Age genetics both part, play a part in hearing loss, and we know that age is the greatest predictor. However, that we know also know that hearing loss is has increased about 30% since the 1980s and the 1990s. Why do you think that is? I encourage you to take a look at the ad on the right side of the slide. Volume and time exposure greatly can affect hearing loss in young people. To give you an example of, of you know, the different types of sounds that are in our environment, a normal conversation is about 60 decibels. If you turn on your vacuum to clean the floors, that might be around 85 decibels. You may have gone to a concert and had ringing in your ears afterwards. Um, this is another example of damage that can be done when the hair cells in the inner ear are exposed to loud sounds that cause sensorineural hearing loss. What's really scary is most of the devices today can reach greater than 100 decibels, and many of your young people are wearing them all day, every day. Listening to 100 uh, decibels for just 15 minutes can cause hearing loss. So it's important it's for healthcare providers to be talking about hearing hygiene. A rule of thumb is that an individual should use their device less than 60% for only 60 minutes a day. In our older uh, adults, presbycusis is the death of hair cells in the cochlea that causes gradual sensual hear hearing loss that's very, very common. Once again, we know that age is the greatest predictor of hearing loss. I always remember presbycusis because we have a nursing home in my town that's called the Presbyterian Home that older adults live in. So presbycusis, Presbyterian Home, older adults. Just one of those vocab words that you need to know for your boards. On this slide, there are two different ear disorders. On the left is a cholesteatoma. An ecclesiatoma is an abnormal non-cancerous skin growth that develops in the middle ear behind the eardrum. It can be caused by repeated middle ear infections and basically is the body's um, shedding these um, old layers of skin. This uh, disorder typically will cause conductive hearing loss. You can see the disorder. Remember, if you can see something um, when you do the your um, exam of the ear, often this going to be conductive hearing loss. On the right is a perichondral hematoma. This is also called a cauliflower ear or a wrestler's ear. Basically what happens if the pinna is struck or there's been some trauma to the, um, the, the pinna, blood pools underneath the skin and this needs to be drained immediately and a compression dressing placed upon it. If it isn't done, um, the patient will have a deformity to the ear that you can see in the picture on the right. I want you to take a look at the drugs that are on this uh, slide. Many of these drugs are commonly prescribed. Um, you may even be on some of them. When you think about your antibiotics, your aminoglycosides, macrolides, quinolones, vancomycin, um, you think about NSAIDs, your um, loop diuretics, ACE inhibitors, your SSRIs, um, these can all co be co toxic to the cochlea or the vestibular um, structures in the ear. These uh, medications have the potential to cause hearing loss. Um, you know, autotoxicity, you know, was discovered with uh, streptomycin in the 1940s. Basically, these patients were on streptomycin on very high doses, and it was noted that they were having hearing loss accompanying their uh, recovery. So it's really important that you, as a prescriber, are aware that there are many medications that you're prescribing that can cause sensual neural hearing loss. So if you have a patient that comes to the office complaining of hearing loss, it's important that you do a medication review. 
This slide is a review of the structures of the ear and how sound travels to the brain. If you look all the way to the light, you'll, uh, the, to the left, excuse me, you're going to see the sound goes into the external canal, travels through to the middle ear. Um, this is where the structures that are affected with conductive hearing loss. So that's a neuro hearing loss, which you see on the right, involves the inner ear, the cochlea, and the auditory nerve and brain. So conductive hearing loss um, is the second most common cause of hearing loss. The patient may tell you they have full ears. Um, we talked a little bit earlier that you often will see something in with uh, conductive hearing loss. It might be something or someone, like a little cockroach. Yep, that's a true story. Um, it may be a foreign body. There's plenty of foreign bodies that I've seen. Um, kids often have an affinity. They put beans in their ears, Legos, um, pieces of erasers, and you've seen cerebral impactions as well. All those are conductive, examples of conductive hearing loss. Sensorineural hearing loss is the most common cause of hearing loss. Um, to give you an example, 90% of people who wear hearing aids have sensual neuro hearing loss. You can't see sensual neuro hearing loss. Okay, this is a dysfunction of cranial nerve eight. Um, it can be caused by advanced age, trauma. It could be viruses like cytomegalovirus, rubella, measles, mump, varicella, um, zoster, and syphilis. Also, sensorineural hearing loss can be caused by excessive noise, the AirPods, occupational exposures, and expo our military personnel often um, are exposed to very um, high decibels of noise as well in their um, duties. So how do we assess hearing loss in the office? First of all, we're gonna do a physical exam. We're going to auscultate the neck for bruise. We're gonna look for any signs of trauma to the ear, the head. We're gonna um, take a look at the mastoid. Push on that mastoid. If there's pain, that's a, a medical emergency. These patients need to go to the emergency room. Um, you're gonna do an otoscopic exam. You're gonna do a whisper test to check the gross hearing. Okay, you then you're going to assess the Weber and Renee together to differentiate between conductive versus sensory neural hearing loss. What you're going to use for that is a 512 hertz tuning fork. It's important to note um, the correct procedure to do a whisper test. So basically, the examiner is going to stand at about an arm's length behind the patient to prevent any lip reading. Um, the opposite ear canal will be occluded by the patient or examiner, and the tragus is rubbed in a circular motion to um, block hearing from that ear. It's important that the examiner exhales and whispers and a combination of numbers and letters um, will be spoken. For example, 4K2. Whispering at the end of the exhalation to ensure a quiet and a standardized voice is standardized as standardized voice as possible. If the patient responds correctly, hearing is considered normal and no further screening is necessary in that ear. If the patient responds incorrectly, then repeat using a different number letter combination. If on repeated testing, the patient can answer three out of possible of uh, six numbers letters correctly, the patient passes. If they cannot answer three out of six or more, the patient fails that um, uh, test for that ear. You want to repeat the sequence in the opposite ear using different combinations or numbers. Um, you know, you have to remember with our older adults, too, if they have memory problems, they may need simplified letter number combinations to compensate for their inability to remember. Why is this a big deal um, and why should we be doing it? You know, hearing loss prevents our patients from understanding conversation. It contributes to cognitive decline. It can lead to social isolation. Um, Hearing impairment is the third most uh, chronic impairment for our older adults. So it's also helpful to ask the family or the patient if they've noticed any changes in their hearing to describe these changes and if they've had any prior treatment. Patients with no wax occlusion of their ears and who failed the whisper test have a hearing loss that correlates with approximately 30 decibel loss. This level of hearing loss has a significant effect on communication for our patients as well. So let's talk about the Weber and Renee tests. The Weber and Renee tests um, evaluate cranial nerve eight. The Renee test, there's a bit of controversy how to say it. Is it Renee 
or Renee. A nice way to remember when you try to differentiate the two, what is what is talking about Renee behind the penny. So the Renee or Renee is done when you use the tuning fork and place it behind the pinna. You expect to see the air conduction to be two times longer than bone conduction. For the Weber test, if you look at this picture, it kind of looks like a little crown that would be on the top, a big W on top of the head. Um, when you are assessing the Weber test, basically you're trying to find out whether or not it's left or right. So it's going to, you're going to be looking to see whether or not, or whether or not, um, you have any lateralization. In a normal Weber exam, you'll have no lateralization. So what's the procedure on how you would do your Weber and Renee? So the first thing you would do um, to do this exam is to strike the tuning fork and place it behind the mastoid and ask the patient to let you know when they no longer hear the sound. When they indicate that they can no longer hear the sound, you're going to move the tuning fork about one centimeter away from the external auditory canal and you're going to ask the patient if they can hear the sound. If they can hear the sound, this is a positive Renee, meaning the air conduction is greater than bone conduction. For the Weber test, you're going to be comparing um, bone conduction and if there is um, lateralization to um, both ears at the same time. So you're going to place a tuning fork immediately on the patient's head just before the, the hairline on the forehead and you're going to ask them if they hear the sound in both ears. And you're also going to ask them if the sound is louder in one ear rather than the other. Lateralization is when the patient reports the sound is louder in one ear as compared to the another. Again, if your patient complains of pain upon palpitation or when you do the Rene test, this may be an indication that your patient has mastoiditis. This is a medical emergency and the patient needs to be vetted to the emergency room for blood work as well as uh, imaging to take a look at the mastoids. And this usually is a CAT scan. So let's talk about the Weber test. So with the Weber test, a normal finding is no lateralization. In conductive hearing loss, the sound will lateralize to the corrupted or affected ear. In sensorineural hearing loss, the sound will switch and lateralize to the unaffected ear. So let's look at the two test results together um, when you do the Weber and Renee. So step one, you're going to do your Renee test. If the air conduction is less than the bone conduction, the Renee test is negative and conductive hearing loss is suspected. You would then move on to do the Weber test. Um, if the Weber test lateralizes, it will um, it lateralize to the worst ear or the corrupted ear. If you do step one and the air conduction is greater than the bone conduction, this is a positive Renee test, okay? You're gonna move on to your Weber test. If there's lateralization to the left, remember it switches and there will be right sensible neuro hearing loss. If there's lateralization to the right, again, we're going to switch, and there's left sensible neuro hearing loss. Let's see if we can put some of these findings to work in a day in the clinic. So a day at the clinic. The advanced practice nurse would be concerned that the following patients may have conductive hearing loss. Please select all that apply. A, 87-year-old female with presbycusis with high-pitched sounds. B, 20-year-old male with cerumen impaction. C, 28-year-old with past, a past medical history of head trauma. D, 33-year-old with a past medical history of meningitis. E, 55-year-old who reports taking vancomycin, aspirin, and Lasix. What do you think the answer is? The correct answer is B. So when you look at this question, we know that presbycusis causes sensorineuro hearing loss, as can trauma, meningitis, and autotoxic meds. 
we know that with a cerumen impaction, you can see something occluding the ear canal. Remember, with conductive hearing loss, you often can see that there's a problem and there's something that's not allowing that conductor to get the train to the tympanic membrane. Let's try another one. When assessing the patient, the advanced practice nurse notes that the Rene test is positive bilaterally and the Weber test lateralizes to the right ear. What do the physical findings indicate? A, conductive hearing loss on the right, B, sensual neuro hearing loss on the left, C, normal findings. The answer is B. The Rene test is positive bilaterally, so air conduction is greater than bone conduction. So you suspect sensual neuro hearing loss. If the Weber test lateralizes to the right, then there is sensual neuro hearing loss on the left. Let's try another one. The Rene and Weber test assess which of the following cranial nerves. A, cranial nerve two, B, cranial nerve 11, C, cranial nerve eight, D, cranial nerve three, four, and six. What do you think the answer is? The correct answer is C, cranial nerve eight. Let's talk for a minute about the rationale. Cranial nerve two is when we test the optic nerve. How do we do that? We do a visual acuity with a Schnellen test. Cranial nerve 11 is the accessory nerve. How do we test that? That's when we ask our patients to do a shoulder shrug. Cranial nerve three, four, and six are the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. How do we test that? That's when we look at the extraocular movements of the eye. So the answer is cranial nerve eight, which is when we do the Weber and Rene tests. Let's try another one. When assessing the patient, the advanced practice nurse notes that the Rene test is negative on the right and the Weber test lateralizes to the right ear. What do these physical findings indicate? A, conductive hearing loss on the right, B, sensual neuro hearing loss on the left, C, normal findings. The correct answer is conductive hearing loss on the right. Let's look at this question. A Weber test that lateralizes to the right can indicate two things, conductive hearing loss on the right or sensual neuro hearing loss on the left. The Rene test is negative, meaning that the air conduction is less than the bone conduction. So that being said, conductive hearing loss is suspected. This patient has conductive hearing loss on the right. When the advanced practice nurse performs the Weber test, which of the fouling is considered an abnormal finding? A, lateralization to one ear. B, no lateralization of the sound to either ear. C, air conduction is greater than bone conduction. D, air conduction is less than bone conduction. Think about this question for a moment. For this question, the answer is lateralization to one ear. We know that a normal finding for a Weber test is no lateralization. So an abnormal test would be lateralization to one ear. When we are comparing air conduction to bone conduction, that is findings that we would find in the Rene test. So C and D are excluded. A 12-year-old presents to the clinic with ear pain and hearing loss. The physical exam shows that the left tympanic membrane is red, has a purulent effusion, bulging, and dull. The Rene test is negative on the left ear, and the Weber test lateralizes to the left. These findings indicate what type of hearing loss? A, sensual neuro hearing loss. B, conductive hearing loss. C, normal findings. The answer to this question is B, conductive hearing loss. One of the things that can help you with this exam question is that when you look into the ear, they're giving you findings that you see in the otoscopic exam. If the Rene is negative and the air conduction is less than the bow conduction, we always suspect conductive hearing loss. And it, the, this, in this patient, there's lateralization to the left. The physical exam shows an a, a, 
acute otitis media, which causes conductive hearing loss. You can see conductive hearing loss. So the answer is B, conductive hearing loss. Let's try one more. A 67 male presents to the clinic with a past medical history of Meniere's disease. The physical exam elicits a positive Rene test bilaterally, and the Weber test lateralizes to the right. The advanced practice nurse interprets these results as A, conductive hearing loss on the left, B, conductive hearing loss on the right, C, sensoneuro hearing loss on the left, D, sensoneuro hearing loss on the right. The correct answer for this question is C, sensoneuro hearing loss on the left. We know with Meniere's disease that these patients often will have episodic vertigo with nausea and vomiting, and they often have sensoneuro hearing loss, tinnitus, and pressure of, or fullness in the involved ear. When performing a Weber test on a healthy adult with a normal ear examination, the advanced practice nurse expects to find what results. A, the patient reports sound lateralizes. B, the patient reports no sound is heard bilaterally. C, the patient reports that the sound is heard equally in both ears. The answer to this question is C. The patient reports that the sound is heard equally in both ears. Remember, a normal Weber exam will have no lateralization. Let's do another. The advanced practice nurse examines the patient and notes that the patient has a cerumen impaction, including the left tympanic membrane. When performing the Weber test on this patient, the advanced practice nurse would expect which of the following Weber test results. A, the patient will report lateralization to the right ear. B, the patient will report lateralization to the left ear. C, the patient will report no lateralization of the sound. The answer to this question is B. A cerumen impaction is an example of conductive hearing loss. Again, you can see conductive hearing loss, so it makes sense that the Weber test will lateralize to the corrupted ear or the ear that's bad or has a problem. B is the answer. The advanced practice nurse would be concerned that the following patients may have sensoneuro hearing loss. Select all that apply. A, 87 female with arthritis. B, 20-year-old male with acute otitis media. C, 45-year-old female with cerumen impaction. D, 33-year-old with past medical history of meningitis. E, 49-year-old male who was an arterial specialist in the Army for 20 years. The correct answer is A, D, and E. When you think about the rationale, we know that age is the greatest predictor for sensoneuro hearing loss. So A makes a lot of sense that the patient is 87. D is a 33-year-old with a past medical history of meningitis. We know that some viruses can cause sensoneuro hearing loss. The other correct answer is E, a 49-year-old male who is an arterial specialist. That being said, we know that they've had a lot of noise exposure due to their occupation. B and C are not the right answer because both of those are examples of conductive hearing loss. What is the common finding in patients with a cholesteatoma? A, painful ear with drainage. B, perforated tympanic membrane. C, cerumen impaction. D, normal examination of the tympanic membrane. The correct answer is perforated tympanic membrane. Note that with a cholesteatoma, about 90% of the patients have a ruptured tympanic membrane. Also, these patients may have foul-smelling drainage from the ear as well. So B is the best answer for this question. What is the most common cause of conductive hearing loss? A, foreign body, B, perforated tympanic membrane, C, presbycusis, D, trauma. The correct answer is A, foreign body. 
Foreign body and cerumen are the most common causes of conductive hearing loss. So a quick recap. The Weber test is going to tell you whether or not the problem is on the right or the left. In conductive hearing loss, the Weber test will lateralize to the bad ear, whereas in sensorineural hearing loss, it will radiate and lateralize to the good ear. Here's another view of that table that I provided you earlier. I hope that this will help you understand the Weber and Renee tests in your clinical practice and help you ace those exam questions on your boards and your examinations at your universities. I hope this helped and keep looking for some more free resources on APRN Central. Have a great night.